hear me? Yeah. Now we can. Yeah, hear me now. Good. All right, well, welcome to the first of our series. Um, and this is a first course. We've not done this before, so uh, bear with this is being heard out the case. So uh, my name is Will Martin. I'm with the Engineering Division. I'm the Engineering Division. Quick introduction here to tell you what this is all about and then we'll get started. So for you who are, you know, there are a lot of JLab employees in here, but some of them aren't. So what, are, what is JLab? Well, we're a nuclear physics uh, research facility funded by DOE. The main machine on site is called CBAP, Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility. It's running at six jet electrons can continuous beam. We're in the process of a 12 gem upgrade. If you came in the gate, you saw everything's all torn up. And that's because we're in the middle of a $300 million upgrade to double the energy. Uh, we also have on site another machine called Free Electron Laser. It's the world's most powerful tunable laser. It uses the same technology that we do in the main CBAP facility. Right now, so this is an engineering division uh, initiative. Engineering division is about 180 staff, engineers, designers, and technical folks. So what about this seminar? What's the history and what's the mission behind it? I've been thinking about this for probably six or seven years after talking to a few engineers that we wanted to do this. And we talked to Sally Fister, who's part of the public affairs, and we got started on it. And the idea was we have a lot of new staff coming in. We have a lot of neat technology and a lot of experience here at the lab. We'd like to develop our staff by presenting some of this stuff. So in talking to Sally, we said, why just limit it to JLab? So we went ahead and went out, out outside, and there's several folks here from the outside, to, to share these uh, our experiences and what, what we've learned in supporting the machine. So the idea here was to not only network within the lab, but also network from outside the lab. So in a while here, I'll have a little bit of introduction. We'll see who all is here. So, networking people who do engineering efforts and support for our nation's science mission. And you look at the shipyard around the corner. We have NASA. We have this place. So there's a lot of work going on that's supported by our top tax dollars. So why we should talk about it, share what we know. Um, so we see this program as something that will continue on. Um, you'll see there's eight sessions here, and they're focused on cryogenics. And we we kind of cheated a little bit. Um, this this session, or the first five of them, have been presented, I think, about three times now at the Cryogenic Engineering Conference yeah. as, as a class. And so um, they have their material well understood. There's a book that goes with it that you can get. And uh, we thought this would be a great way to get started. So, but I don't see it as an end either. There's quite a few other interesting um, subject areas that we can deal with around here. So, you know, our forte here, because we have uh, superconducting uh, radio frequency structures, that's why we have cryogenics. There's quite a number of engineering challenges in that area, as well as superconducting magnets and just playing with magnet technology. We'd also love to see, and you can come up and talk to me afterwards, some material from outside the lab coming in here. We'd love to have guest speakers and folks talking about and do some very interesting stuff down there in the shipyard. They have to kill me after you tell me about it, but, um, or NASA. So we'd love to hear from you folks as well uh, and share our experiences. Okay, so this series, I kind of alluded to it. The first five here are kind of one package. Um, this one's changed as we change here at the lab and how we're doing things. But these four are all subject of a book that uh, Raoul has self-published. You will get a copy of it. So if you come back for session number two, you're going to get a three-grade binder with that book in there. There'll be enough room in it to uh, put the handouts from these sessions that are just uh, presentations that aren't covered in the book. These two sessions right here are uh, the product of two theses, one by Pete and one by uh, Matt Wright, very specific to these plans. And the data radius is going to close out with what we're doing for our upgrade. So tennis, we have advertised eight CEUs. I've learned a lot about CEUs. 
So a lot of this uh, documentation you're seeing, including the evaluation, has to do with getting your continuing education units if you want them. That's why you need to check in as well. So we'll provide all the documentation that's necessary to get your CDUs. We calculated it so that you could miss two sessions. I would suggest you not, if you want to get anything out of here, not miss any of these sessions. I've been working with Ralph long enough to know that if, if I miss a little bit here, I'm going to be lost. It's dense material and he moves through it quickly. So my suggestion is try and hit all of those. So a little bit more documentation. I told you a little bit about the handouts, the repeated binders. Uh, we have the survey forms. We always have to deal a little bit with safety here. So there, if you hear a fire alarm go off and alarm, there are exits in the back, exit here in front, exit over here. We always have to go to a muster point, the preferable muster points out by the flagpole in front of the building. If you can't get to it, you muster in behind here in the parking lot. Um, I don't see any laptops, but if you have laptops or you're plugging anything in, watch out for trip hazards. Also, no sitting in the aisles. And Bruce, no standing in the back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, also, 911 works for emergencies. You don't have to dial anything else. 911, the guards will come, everybody will come in. Contacts, uh, fine ladies, Marissa and Tanya are over here. If you have any questions, logistics, you can ask them. Stand up, Marissa. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We're missing one who's you know, something cold, and she'll be here for the rest of the You can also ask me. We love to get feedback. Again, this is the first time we've done it. We want to improve it. And love to hear ideas for other topics and such. So let us know. Um, so now I'm going to do a few introductions. The first one is, who are you guys? OK, let's do the easy one. JLab employees, stick your hands up, please. Hold them there for a minute. You guys who don't have your hands up, look around you. Okay, thanks. Now there's two folks here, at least from ASME. Would you hold your hands up? There's one, there's two. Okay. CNU, Christopher Newport, didn't make it today? Okay. Um, Commonwealth of Virginia, DPOR. Okay, and somebody registered from there. Uh, modern Machine, I think I saw it. Modern Machine, I'm missing all these. Okay, Michigan State. Yeah, there we go, Michigan State University got a good basketball team there. <laughs> NASA. Okay, there were supposed to be about 12 of you guys. Northrop Grumman. Okay, great, good to see you here. Old Dominion. Okay, Thomas Nelson. Here, here we go. Okay, Thomas Nelson and William Mary. And that's wow. Okay. And UMass. Up there. So welcome. And again, the idea is to be able to uh, exchange ideas and such. So take a look around and who's there. So now I'm going to introduce Rao, our speaker. So Rao's got a, a two uh, masters in mechanical engineering, one out of India, one out of the University of Wisconsin. He went ahead and got his PhD at Oklahoma State in uh, Stillwater. And then uh, he, over his the life of his uh, career here, he's published over 30 technical private papers on cryogenics. He's a fellow of the Cryogenic Society of America. He's an adjunct professor at ODU. Uh, when he's not been in academia, 10 years in, uh, in industry, at CTI, Helix, and Coke Industries. I think they all keep buying each other, right? And then about 20 years in the DOE system, um, he was down to the Superconducting Super Collider before it closed up. And he's been here at JLab since then. So welcome, Ralph. Let's get started.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, Ghani, uh, group, and, uh, this is to cover the world view of uh, cryogenics at Jefferson Lab. Mm. Uh, and, uh, so basically, these are the topics uh, we're going to go over. One is uh, what's JDAM world view and uh, what's cryogenics. And, uh, Applications and how, how is the temperature chosen for the J lab and uh, what are you of operation of the cryo plants and what's the down time, what's utility cost. Uh, other activities the cryo group uh, is engaged in here both in education and support of the labs and at the end is the summary. So, uh, this <coughs> This JLab is a 2,000 member international user community, and it's a it's operates with the superconducting accelerator, uh, It has a 100% duty factor with the uh, presently operating at 6 GeV, and uh, we are expanding into the 12 GeV. <laughs> CVAP has a lot of innovative designs uh, incorporated into it, and it supports it. Uh, beam is uh, sent to three beams. All uh, three are complementary in uh, in the Exploring the quark gluon structure matter. That's the mission of the lab. And the uh, site of our review is uh, it's, a, it's a North Linac and it's a South Linac, and uh, then we have the ARCs, it's the uh, cryo modules in the Linacs, then we have the central gilibri cooker which supports the cryogens, we have the FEO. Uh, but th this is the same uh, <laughs> cryogenic uh, complex uh, where all the main central equilibrium profile is housed there. And for the end stations, we have the cryogenic uh, building here where the small refrigerator here. And we have the CDF, uh, the test lab in this area. So these are all support the cryogenic activities. Uh, and, uh, and these are the three halls, experimental halls, uh, the beam is focused in on. So what's cryogenics? That uh, is the question. So any of the, the production of temperature below minus 150C is defined as a cryogenic fluid all the, uh, at one atmosphere uh, uh, pressure. So these are the fluids which have a boiling point uh, uh, like methane is like 111, oxygen 90, argon is and ni nitrogen is 77, neon. So these are the cryogenic fluids uh, which have a boiling point below 150 Kelvin at one atmosphere. Uh, so some of your some of you folks are still uh, use Fahrenheit uh, centigrade compared to Kelvin, but with that, just give you a relative thing. We operate CBAF at 2 Kelvin, uh, very close to the absolute zero. And uh, of course, uh, some of our experimental halls and the test lab, most of the equipment is some at uh, test lab we operate at 2 Kelvin, some at 4, four and a half. And nitrogen is 78 Kelvin, and this is the start of the cryogenic uh, range. And uh, so these are the other equivalent temperatures of Celsius and Fahrenheit for the people. So what are the applications of the cryogenics? Mostly it's used for gas separation in the earlier days. And first, uh, helium was liquefied by Cumberland Owens in uh, 1908 in the Netherlands. And he observed superconductivity in 1911, exactly 100 years ago. This is the 100 years anniversary of the superconductivity. So after 50 years, um, nothing will happen in the cryogenic field. Then they started using it for the magnets and all that. Um, so slowly, by after uh, 1960 uh, time frame, superconductivity has been applied to uh, magnets and, and to the labs. Uh, so what are the other applications? So this led to a lot of physics advanced research, medical equipment like MRI. This is the start where, when I start working in the cryogenics, it started as a NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and people didn't like the nuclear, so they just renamed MRI as the same thing. And, <laughs> and initially I started selling refrigerators for these magnets, uh, going around to GE, Siemens, and all those places. That's how I started my career way back in the early 80s. Uh, then applied a lot of instruments, other applications of bio, space research, and vacuum, and uh, like uh, high speed. Uh, Trains or elevated trains and things like that. 
So what, what's the upper conductive gate? I mean, it's, uh, there is no resistance below a critical temperature. That's what the superconductivity means. Practically, the material loses its resistance to electricity. So there are two types. This allows the, the low temperature superconductors which operate below 20 Kelvin. These are what we use for both magnets and RF, which we use it in our uh, accelerators. There are high temperature superconductors which started becoming more prominent from the mid 80s during our SSC time frame. It put us back like a year or two because they said superconductors, so high temperature pieces are going to take over and so we stop and eventually that delay also helped, I mean, kind of precipitated into the cancellations. If we progressed more, probably it would have survived, but as one, one delay after the other, this one of the delays did help. So application of the, what are the applications of the cryogenics? We apply for uh, accelerators which use magnets and RF cavities. Uh, at room temperature, the iron core basically saturates around 2 tesla. But we, if we want to build a high uh, power uh, accelerators, uh, you need a lot of uh, high uh, magnetic force or uh, magnets or the RF cavities. So uh, it's a lot easier to build high magnetic field uh, magnets with the superconductivity. Like 10 tesla is a very normal. Flat dust it has magnets. Uh, I remember uh, the last refrigerator we supplied in the 80s was for a 30 year, 35 Tesla magnet in the 80s. So, so that in the, with superconductivity, there are a lot of advancements in the uh, magnet, I mean, the magnet technology. Similarly, I mean, the RF cavities, which we use here, are kind of operate at room temperature with the copper cavities and all that below for 500, mega, 500 hertz. But as you go in high frequency, they are, they are not functional. So for high uh, strength magnets and uh, high frequency RF cavities, cryogenics is a must. And also what it does is uh, gives a high, uh, I mean, for a given energy of uh, energy and accelerator design, so for can, they will go over the cost because since it requires fewer number of magnets with higher magnetic field and higher uh, cavity energies and less length of the accelerator. And also this lead to lower operating cost because a lot of uh, these copper cavities and all they have RF at room temperature have a lot more losses than superconducting level. Although we have to pay for the cryogenics, still we come ahead in the operating cost in the cryogenics uh, than room temperature. So therefore, all large accelerators uh, and super, superconducting structures uh, all operate at uh, cryogenic temperatures and they prove to be cost effective. That's why if you look at any of the labs today, which are good size, uh, are all super and cryogenic. So all particle accelerators, they require cryogenic basically. So what do we pay for it? So, so <coughs> this is called the Carmo analysis where if you take a room temperature of air conditioner at, at home, so if you uh, have a, uh, to pour one watt of cooling in your room, all it takes is a 0.14 watt, and you get around six watts of cooling for one watt of uh, electricity you spend. This is not a violation of any laws which we go into in the technical sessions. This is uh, because uh, in a heat, in a refrigeration, all we are doing is you are picking up heat like a bucket. And they're transferring, they're not converting anything. So you can provide six watts of cooling with one watt of electric power ideally. Uh, and uh, so as you go lower and lower in temperature, like uh, around liquid nitrogen, it requires around three watts per one watt at liquid nitrogen. And at four Kelvin, it requires 70 watt per watt. Uh, that's one atmosphere. At two Kelvin, where we operate, we are at 150 watt per watt. This is ideal. Everything is reversible, there are no losses. This is the minimum amount of work you have to put in into the system to get one watt of cooling. So this basically defines what your theoretical minimum watts you need to provide for a one watt of cooling. So given that, uh, so when they have to choose the temperature uh, for the CBAC accelerator, so they did an optimization study to see so there are static losses, there are other losses which are temperature independent, there are some losses which are temperature dependent. So then they, they made a uh, normalized the cap operating cost and a capital cost and they came up with two Kelvin. But there is another fundamental parameter which feeds into it, it's called super critical fluid. 
which is around 2.18 Kelvin, where a fluid does not uh, has no boiling. I mean, it transfers the heat by conduction to the surface and surface evaporation. So what it provides for the cryomodules is a very quasi non-disturbing state of heat transfer. So you do not have any disturbance to the cavities from the boiling liquid or anything. So it's a very powerful and makes it uh, your beam and all your experimental things much more uh, stable and steady state without any other uh, influences from the boiling liquid. Those. So what does JLF cryogenic room do? I mean, that's one of the questions a lot of people ask. No? You guys always run around and, uh, and what exactly you guys do? And this is some of the things what we do. We operate existing plants. We design new plants for the J lab. We design plants for other labs like MSU, SNS, NASA. And we optimize operating plants uh, for J lab and other labs. And we support cryo R&D. We support education. And we'll go into that. Okay, what, what's a, this is our main, the main hops that, uh, for the cryogenic hops at the CBAM. This is our sunny helium liquefier, uh, which has six compressors. Each first stage is around 600 hops, second stage is 2250 20 hops power. And we draw in around six megawatts of power, and we produce four Kelvin liquid in these, and then we take that into the, our accelerator, we pump on it to 40 millibar with cold compressors, and we return it around 25 Kelvin into the cold box, and we repeat the cycle. And that's what the original DSO diagram, where it has the first stage compressor, second stage compressor, it goes through the expanders, provides some shield cooling, and it goes on into another levels of expanders until we get to 4 Kelvin, <coughs> and we go from there and we expand down and we use vacuum pumps. Of course, we added one more stage later. So there are three plants here uh, which support. One is the central helium liquefier, which supports the linear accelerator, I mean, Linux, both the CBF and the FPO. We have end station, which just supports the experimental house. We have CTF, which supports all the tests. And we support continuous unattended operation 24 7, 365. And this two K operation was started in 1994. And the Linux were only one of ones in two or three people to like it. That means we have to have the trial system on board around the clock from 1994 until now for, to keep without warming up of the Linux, except this is the only time we did. So that tells you about the trial system operations and uh, what we do here <coughs> in a nutshell. So and we, are, we maintain the equipment, compressors, motors, vacuum pumps, and all this, and we coordinate. Uh, I mean, uh, maintenance activities with all the interfaces we have with our uh, support facilities, cooling tower, selected power, and we coordinate, we, we uh, get liquid nitrogen for pre-cooling. Like we told you, it only costs like 3 watts per watt uh, compared to 70 watts per watt for helium. So we buy liquid nitrogen as a pre-coolant, and for the amount we use, it's not cost effective for us to produce liquid nitrogen here, so we procure it every day. We get a truck, uh, truck and a half every day. And we get helium gas to uh, supplement the, the, the helium we lose. And we modify experimental arrangements depending upon what type of experiments and maintenance, uh, you do and all that we change. And, we, and also sometimes there will be a drastic change in capacity or mode of operation. We set the plans to be more effective uh, operational wise and everything in those modes. So these are daily activities. So we got, this is the, CHL1 is the present plant which is operating, which is 4.6 Kelvin, 2.1 Kelvin, I mean at 2.1 K. And it has a 15, 12 kilowatts at uh, 35 to 55 ratio. And we can also supply 10 grams to other users. And this is the CHL2, which is present under construction. And uh, this will uh, make the, go from 6 GU to the 12 GU. So this is our compressor room, uh, which has the uh, 6 megawatts. These are the first stage, each one with 600 halves, and this is the second stage, each one with the 20 to 50 halves for compressors. And this is the cold box when they were putting it in in the early 90s, uh, coming through the room, which has a horizontal section. And uh, so this is the CHL2 compressors on the drawing board now, which are getting built. 
and this is the code. The CHL2, instead of putting the P like what we did in CHL1, we split it into two code boxes. One inside, which will go from uh, 60, uh, 60 Kelvin down, and one outside goes from 300K to 60 Kelvin. So that outside doesn't require a building, and also any nitrogen, what we use here for free cooling can be vented, and so it makes it more, not more cost effective. So we don't have any free joints and other issues. So what's a 2K technology? Cold compressors first were introduced to the uh, helium by in the Taurus of Brown. So that was the first application for a 15 grams a second. They use a two-stage initial at the close to the load, but they use the warm sub-atmospheric compressors to get to the two Kelvin. So it's a combination of cold compressors and the warm compressors. But at CBAP, this is the first one to use all four, now five-stage compressors, which use all the sub-atmospheric flow compressed to the above pressure. And it's 15 times more, more in flow. And it has resulted in significant growing pains. So it, it took us a while to get this plant going. So this was the original plant, so then we had to add additional heat exchanges. And uh, it was commissioned in 1994. And we were able to get around 75% availability. This was, a, this was not our goal uh, to have 25% of the down time for the cryogenic. So, so then JLab management decided we got to do something about it. So we had spare compressors we bought for the C1, um, for the first 12 watts. So we decided to say, well, we were not too lucky with uh, going with the industry. So what we learned, um, we, need, we should be able to do a better job. So we built this plant ourselves right on the floor here. And we put it down. And it has five coil compressors. And we improved the thermal side from we made some other things which are smaller to be bigger. And so we increase, what it did is for this given 4K, which uses all the compressors, we increase the 2K capacity by 10% of 500 watts. In today, each watt of 2K is worth more than $5,000 uh, to produce a 2K. So if we gain 500 watts, that means we increase the value of the CVAP price by 2.5 million that day. For the same input, we increase the capacity because end use has been increased by that much. So we also increase the operational amp up, say, where original plant, we always have to run at full capacity whether we need it or not, we didn't have the time on. And it used to take a lot of time to each time we trip it to bring it back. We commissioned this in three days. The first one took two and a half to three years to get that going. So, so it's running from 99. So we are very proud of what we did. So at that time, Management said, oh, go back and modify the original plan back to what you did in this plan to use it for the 12 job. So which, that's what we did. And this is the capacity of the plan. This is our static heat load in the Linux. And this is the real 2K load, the support capacity. So as we come down in pressure, as you have to operate at lower and lower temperatures, the capacity of the plan comes down. But nominally, it's around 240 grams per second, uh, uh, 2 Kelvin. Plant. So these are the internals of what we have modified the original plant, and uh, these are the internals still there. So it's presently located right next to the original 4 Kelvin box. So what are the 2 Kelvin technologies? The, <coughs> the JLAM 2 Kelvin technology is um, This is the largest plant today uh, in the world. Four, four parts, even CERN has only half size plants. Each plant is only half of this size. And uh, all, uh, 2K, all the 2K flow here is compressed to the above atmosphere, whereas CERN, half the uh, CERN and other places, only halfway they go through coal compressors, other halfway they use warm compressors, where the possibility of early is very high at room temperature. So. So we will eventually probably show up in the reliability and availability where we are operating from 94 the first plant and from 99 the second plant with the availability greater than 98%. So it, this proved to be very reliable uh, with this uh, going all the flow through the uh, cold compressors and with no warm sub atmospheric components. So that's a 2K technology. Jefferson Lab leads in the world. 
So a lot of people walk in front of the CHL don't see what's behind. There's a lot of equipment behind CHL what supports all the activities which you see in the linear at uh, the linear X and electro experiments. So there's quite a bit of we have gas tanks, we have nitrogen, we have vaporizers, we have oil removal. There's a lot of equipment behind CHL. And in addition to in the compressor and cold box. So and this is where we produce two calvert. And this is where we connect to the Linux. This comes to the North Linux, and there's another one which goes to the South Linux. And there is, <coughs> so the CHL1, this is the compressor room. This is where we connect to the South Linux and North Linux. This is what we are adding for the 12 Jeff. So if you, and also Jefferson Lab is unique in terms of a lot of transfer lines we use. We have it. Uh, in the tunnel, we have uh, supply and return transfer lines both South and North, uh, North uh, Linux, and we have the FAR, we have the transfer lines from CHL to ESR, we have, we removed this transfer line from CH, I mean, ESR to CTL. So we had a network of connecting all the refrigerators to share the capacity depending upon where we have more load, where we have the capacity we need, so we can uh, sh shift from the capacity from one to the other. And uh, so these are the, uh, cross sections of the transfer lines which are developed at Jefferson Lab, which we use at J Lab, SNS, some of these we also use at MS. So, this is the Linac uh, uh, cryo module, this is the ARC. So, the transfer line configuration presently, we CHL1 supplies both injector north, south, FEO, and also handgun CSR. In the 12 year era, CHL1 will supply Linac, uh, I mean, injector and not Linac, and two will supply South Linac and FAR. So, but if there is a maintenance or some failure, catastrophic failure happens, we can go back to 6 job and either one of the plants. That's one of the requirements. And we have an ESR, an end-stage refrigerator, which supports uh, our uh, experimental house. It's a 1500 watt machine. Uh, it was built in 1978. Uh, and Adam is head of the group. He, it was his first cold box when he was at the CDI. And uh, I joined the company later on. Uh, and this is still working and from 1978. It was at Berkeley. We brought it here at Commission 94. This 24 7 operation, and it has uh, more than uh, 150,000, hours of operations today. Uh, this is the compressors for the ESR. And this is a core box, CDI is also built in 78. This is the top of the core box. This is the distribution network to the halls. And this is the purifier in the core box. And yeah, this is the distribution box which takes the core Kelvin production and distributes it to the various halls. <coughs> so this is the oil removal behind ESR where we, and this is the liquid helium storage. And we go from here into the hall. The hall. So this is the network of the transfer lines coming from uh, CHL. Then CHL it goes to ESR. And, uh, then we are now building an ESR2 to support our 12 era operations, which will be a 4 kilowatt plant, which was, which was originally built for SSC. Once SSC was shut down, the plant was idling, and so we, are, we just were installing that. And this just recently been put into the position in the no ESR two building. So these are the experimental halls. We supply all these cryogens to all the various halls and we support all the experiments in these halls. Then the new hall which we are building under the trial job is called Hall D. It also requires a four and a half Kelvin, but it's a small refrigerator. This was also built by our export company CPI in 1980, and it will be housed uh, in this cryo building. This will be the counting house and hall A. So this is the refrigerator built in 1980, and this will be the compressor to support it. So th this is the magnet, which is presently getting tested in the test lab. I remember selling a refrigerator for it in 1984 or 85, so when it was at Los Alamos. These things, go from one place to the other, they never go away. So if you are building something, if you think it's something uh, not good or something, don't think it will disappear, it will haunt you. 
It's one of those things that we still paying our price on some of these things. So if you see something wrong, get rid of it. Don't, don't let it hang around. <laughs> And so this is the CDF. I remember this one, the Bullet CDF, I mean at Coke. Uh, so they, they wanted a refrigerator to test the cram modules. Uh, so they, built, they bought this compressor from my camp. And uh, this was the problem my last refrigerator as the supplier. And uh, they said, yeah, we need it for five years. That was 20 years ago. And so, they depend on it every day. And this is the one which was built uh, uh, in 1980, which is the one we will be shifting to all the, And this also we supplied at the same time to, to the so 88 time frame, uh, 89, to support the cram module. Also. This is where they test the cram modules in the VTA. And this is where they test the assembled cram module. These are the car modules which will go into the Linux and FEL, where the beam is uh, accelerated. So, that's that. The thirst for the crash is continuously increasing and uh, there's no end in sight and uh, always there is a, uh, as we develop more, they want more because there's a next experiment which is beyond what we think. So originally they said, oh, in, uh, I think, uh, Two or three, I remember. Uh, I mean, originally it is a four job, and we were, this plant was sized for 235 2 Kelvin with margin. So we were running with the original 2K plant at the full capacity because we didn't have any terminal capacity, and also it wasn't uh, really efficient. Uh, and there were no redundant uh, compressor or anything. Slowly, we realized it to support 24 7 365 and cannot perform the Linux. We got to do something. We just can't hang on to what we got now. So we started adding slowly. And this is the one I started way back to when I was at the system. When I became a user from the supplier, the lights went on, saying that all the people ask, you know, they'll give me a refrigerator, one kilowatt or ten kilowatt or something. But we never really as a supplier saw what exactly they were doing. But when I became a user, I saw all the things we do are not at one capacity. They vary during cool down, during operation. <coughs> Even the capacity when you specify, we just have a gas, you don't know what it's going to be. And, but these plants are designed to operate at one point. So there are so many papers written, how you can operate at the design TS. Right? And so that's the way the people are operating. That's when, when I became a user, I said, wait, wait a minute, we should not be burning all this power if we don't need all this power. That's when I worked on this floating pressure at SSC, which we worked more after I came here and became the Ghani cycle floating pressure where we will go into that, how it will help a lot of optimization. And we replaced the 2K box with our design, and we added a standby refrigerator to keep during the maintenance period at 4 Kelvin the Linux to once in five years or so, we do major maintenance on our main CHR. At that time, we keep the Linux with the standby. And so now, the present conditions with the original plant, we are running six job, and we are still supplying some additional flow to the halls to support the uh, uh, experiments. And at four job, we optimize to 190 grand. So, and uh, like in two or three, the halls wanted to do a two kilowatt uh, uh, test on it. Uh, and but although they said it's going to be two weeks, so we said okay. The, most cost effective way is to put a vaporizer for the vaporizing the flow after they use it. But then they started using continuously. So then we start, we built for the few weeks they wanted more capacity. So we built the refrigeration recovery and then for the CPF to build the 12 job cryo modules and also to support ILC work and other R&D works, they wanted more capacity. So we are modifying that uh, process to double the efficiency right there as we speak. So these are the modifications we make to put the refrigeration recovery unit at ESR to support you know, from 1500 watts almost to 4 kilowatts. We, we are almost running 4 kilowatts now to the uh, end stations uh, as we speak uh, to support the target loads. So this is the modifications we are doing for the, the CTF to improve the, to almost, we're going to double the efficiency of CTF with these modifications, are the available capacity. 
So, all that said, that the people ask, you know, what are the, I mean, you still have some downtime, and what are the things which will cause the downtime? And so, I thought that's another important thing people need to understand is, see, how they account our downtime is, from the time the cryogenic system causes the trip, takes the beam out, until the beam gets back online, they, the clock is on us. So we, we, are, we are accounted for all the downtime until we get the beam back on it. If we got the beam to go down, I mean, experiment to stop. So we are running, I mean, uh, so all this, from 99 to 208, we were averaging 1.6% downtime. We are causing. And the rest is, uh, I mean, so, but from 208, the downtime is creeping up because our plants are aging. We are running it, and also we have a lot of people now supporting 12 job activities, and we do not have a lot of people available all the time to take care of all the problems in the operation. So uh, our down, I mean, downtime is creeping up, and we are keeping an eye on it as we can afford as much time as we can afford to work on it. But we, end up, we think as we bring the 12 job new plant on, we're going to take down the old plant, and we're going to refurbish it. And, uh, we want to bring down the downtime back down. And other contributors to the downtime, more than ours is the electric power spikes, phase imbalance. If there is a phase imbalance in voltage, my oh, very small percent will shut down our main compressors. And cooling water, well, although the utilities are, I mean, if you talk to MSU, and uh, we started that MSU plant in uh, 99, 2000, and they tell me two thirds of their, or more than two thirds of their downtime is just the utilities, water, and power. And very less than one third is their cryogenic system downtime. And uh, so, instrument day, this weekend is a good example. We had both instrument day compressors fail and uh, at ESR, and uh, so things like that. These cause substantial amount of downtime and substantial amount of power. Uh, energy to bring these systems back. Once the system goes down, we are bringing all the people, whether it's night, weekend, doesn't matter. We had to be up 365 around the clock and 24 7. So we don't have luxury saying that, oh, we'll take care of it Monday or we'll take care of it after the holidays. We got to be available. So the other contribution to downtime on our control system now, originally when CVAP was built on 2020, at that time, the KMAC was the uh, only thing available for controls, and uh, now we are moving away from KMAC into the PLCs, and uh, we'll still have these control card issues and some of the vacuum jackets and all this. We want to work on it during maintenance. Another thing now is the utilities. <coughs> Helium is a very precious fluid, and uh, this is a boiling fluid which one can take us as close to absolute zero. Everything else will freeze up. There's nothing else which will be in fluid form except helium. And most of this coexists in natural gas in very small percent. And there used to be a conservation program started in the, I think in the 20s, 1920 or 1930s, uh, to take all the helium separated from the natural gas and pump it down into the salt mines at Amarillo, Texas. And, uh, but uh, later on, our industry convinced the federal government that uh, putting all that money into underground is not cost effective. And, uh, so they opened the tab. And now we are using like there's no tomorrow. And, and we are the major exporters as of now, but it's not going to last too long and we'll become imports very shortly. So what I'm trying to bring out here is we need to pay our part in conserving all the helium we use here. And I'll get into that. So this is how we receive our helium from the industry, VOC gases. We, we have a Delbury uh, station which completed to the power mm -hmm. gas tanks. And give or take, uh, our average inventory, CPAP, Linux, North, South is around that. House, I mean, FEL is around in liquid liters. House, uh, CHO at the storages, CDF. And the total is around 100,000 liquid liters on site. You might take plus or minus 20 percent, depending upon whether we have low inventory or high inventory. And this is how we are using helium. 
Originally, when we started at 4K, we used to have a lot of flaws, and we worked on it, worked on it, we brought it down to almost uh, uh, 100,000 100, layers. But again, it's creeping up, and is about we lost everything, and we lost that. So on an average, we lose one and a half times our inventory every year. Uh, and we can, we have to do something about it. There is no reason to lose as much as we lose here. A lot of causes are we open something for purging something, and we forget to close it, or we haven't closed it tight enough. Helium is such a slippery fluid, it will leak to anything. That's how we use helium for leak detection to find minus six or minus nine, tend to tar level, level leaks. But if we pay attention in how we use it, uh, we, we can minimize our losses. It also saves, for, and also this is the liquid nitrogen use, and we used to use when we are at uh, low energy. And we have some contamination problem in the core box started in 98, and uh, then, uh, and is it, of course, this is the helium, uh, nitrogen we use to liquefy additional helium during Isabel. And after, we were working on it to bring it down, but after the last shutdown, we again, the heat exchanger found again. So we wanted to uh, clean the CHL cold box, but we're not getting that time because we have to keep it up. So we will be doing that uh, cleanup and we will bring the nitrogen down. So that's one of the things we are working on. We're going to do the maintenance. We cannot afford now because of the beam time and operations. So we will we'll do it once we have the other time. So this is the floating pressure. Ghani cycle, where we used to run at six megawatts constant, whether we needed it or not, but that's when we commissioned it. Then we started slowly allowing it the plant to float, and now if we are at 4, 4 GeV level, we only use 4.2 megawatts instead of 6 megawatts. And that saves more than half a million a year in electric power. Forget about even, it saves a lot more money, I mean, a lot of money even in spare parts because we're not pushing the compressors. <coughs> In availability, it helps every bit of the way. We have no nothing to lose by not pushing the plant to the its peak when we don't need it. And so we took a shot at what what, what is it costing us to operate this kind of plant. So we lose a maximum of this much um, liquid layer thousand two point six thousand uh, two hundred sixty thousand liquid layer per say year, or a minimum of thousand. I mean hundred thousand. On an average, we are losing around 160,000 a year, one and a half times our inventory. So, and if we add all that, this is how we used, we used to originally operate at this electric power, at these losses. And we brought it down as low well as almost $2 million low a year. And sometimes, depending upon our expense go up or we have other losses, it creeps up by a million. But we brought down a substantial uh, operating costs down from the original uh, 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 design, uh, original operating, what the industry recommended us to operate at. So our present goes a little higher than this, but a little low, lower than this. So we operate depending upon the type of experiment we are doing, energy level, how much we are supplying to the all targets and all that, maybe around $4 million level is our utility cost from the cryo point of view. So if I take the Isabel uh, effect out, it doesn't change that much because that's one thing happened in you know, almost 15 years or 16 years. So on an average, it doesn't have much effect. So although, so when DOE asked us, you know, what did you have as a backup for a catastrophe like this when Isabel happened? All we said is nothing because it's such a rare event to have a backup of that much six megahertz of power. To start six megawatt compressor, we need around eight to ten megawatt power station, and we need people who are willing to come in that weather and able to start and operate this plant. They are not realistic, and this is not a common factor to back up. And we said, if that happens, we have to take our licks and roll with the punches and get back on road. And so I think what what I'm trying to say is, if you look at the two numbers, it tells you at an average that one incident is, does not change the average. Of so what we are doing, we were able to justify that is the right on an average, although it's painful at the time when it happened, because it took us three months down, and it took us a lot of around-the-clock operations for all of us. And, but on a cost 
that activates all the that's all. Having a backup doesn't justify because of our big loads and also such a special equipment we support here, and we need all those special people available to attend in those uh, crucial time. Also, we also do R&D, and, uh, uh, and this is the education where Joe Wilson was the operator from the beginning of this plant until 2005 in that year. But when he wanted to do his masters, what he said is, okay, you build this 2K plant, new plant, we are operating our coal compressor somewhere around the total frame was around 30, 34 percent efficient. But meanwhile, we slowly, by adjusting arbitrarily, we push the efficiency up to 42 percent. So I said, okay, Joe, this is your master's thesis. Come up with, we'll give you all the parameters of all the wheels, all the coal compressors and you come up with a study and you do your masters to tell me what combinations of uh, uh, coal compressors, all the five stages should be run for a given flow and a given pressure. So he, that was his thesis and he did a good job of giving the linear energy we need, whether we need uh, 230 grams or whether we need only 190 grams or whether we need what pressure in the linear and what combination. So the thesis will tell us to guide us to what speeds we need to run all these coal compressors. So after we did that, we pushed it up, although theoretically it said there, but practically we were able to run around 49 percent. So it helped us a lot. So doing the, supporting this research helps the student to learn and also help the lab to get ahead in terms of efficiency and other factors. Then this uh, Pete Karunsa, he did his thesis on the small two carbon coal boxes. Now at CTF, we are presently using a three and a half kilowatts per one watt to produce a watt two k. And so I said, hey, that's not reasonable. How much smaller plant is, we got to do something. So he took his, as his master's thesis, he made the parametric study of various combinations. So we are in the, presently in the plans to build uh, a plant which will be uh, around two kilowatts per watt in this size. And this is being funded by SNS, basically because SNS wanted the, their CTF and they give us the money. So, it, so most of R&D is not funded by JLA, it's funded by the other sources. Uh, for example, the purifier. We needed a purifier, all purifiers are aging. We are, Lindy is looking for building their own purifier. We kind of told them, we'll develop it for you, we'll, we'll build ourselves, but we'll give you the drawings. So they said, okay, we'll give you the money. So they gave the money, we did the things. So we built the house and that's presently in the face of commissioning, that's Matt, Matt right? Then we had uh, Arun, he joined us. We need to train him, he has a process and test. So we asked Lindy, you know, you got the 1400, there are more than 2000 around the world. Are you sure? Because that's someone I worked in CTI, when I all some models and all that. And I said, when I left in, in uh, 89, 90, I said, I, I had some thoughts. I wasn't sure they were optimized properly. I said, there are some help. So they said, okay, we'll give you the money. So they funded uh, the research for Earl to do the study, how to improve their capacity. And for a given machine, by making small changes, well, I mean, we showed the uh, capacity can be improved by 30% with very minimal changes to the heat exchanger design and things like that. So we participate with the industry uh, in, in hand in hand to share what we do and also to train our people. And these are our JLab uh, goals. So we want to bring CTF from 3.4 3 kilowatts to this speed's work. And we brought 1.4 kilowatts per watt at present C, uh, CHL to, we want to bring it on to 900 watts per watt, second, next generation CHL, CHL2. So CHL1 will still, because that's designed way before, we, we can only bring it up to 1300 watts per watt. We want to bring it the CHL2 to 900 watt per watt. So these are the <laughs> various activities under the, uh, I mean, this is the floating pressure carry cycle where you can take a plant and we can set it up. This is how the ESR is set up. Because our experiment change day and night. People come in, they turn on some loads, turn off, and we got tired. So the plant will adjust, the input power it goes proportional to what they are drawing. So it doesn't run at full capacity all the time. And these are 
say, like a lot of people, some of you are familiar with some of these cycles, the Clark cycle, which is a constant pressure process, and the Stirling is a constant volume cycle, and uh, the floating pressure diary cycle is a constant pressure ratio cycle, and we'll go into this detail during the other uh, classes we go into. So, what it does is it gives the capacity of the plant to be constant, or in real terms, anywhere from 100 to 40 percent. That means your input power proportionally reduces with the capacity you use instead of running at one fixed point, um, design point. And this is the next one. It's basically the compressor development portfolio. This is funded by NASA. So what we're saying is we, we do a lot of work by taking, we know what our needs are. We try to pair up with who else needs it and who has the deep pockets for us. So, yeah, I mean, it helps both of us, us and them. So, so in R&D, we, we use the title here, we have the Talents Cryogenic Institute where we have all this. We have R&D shared collaboration with industry and labs. We focus in the area of efficiency of process cycles and utilities equipment. And these derived technologies are being actively integrated into industries to make sure my lady, uh, I mean, acquired the patent and acquired all the drawings from the purifier and all the things what we studied for the 1400, 1600. So they are implementing what we do here as an R&D into the real life so that everybody else in the world can get the benefit out of those. So I guess uh, I'm running over a little bit, but uh, you want to say something? Sure. So we, we have yep. another 10 minutes. Yes. We have the room uh, for another half hour. We're willing to go on, but if you need to leave, just please leave out the back door and leave your uh, you can leave your survey forms on the floor back there and I'll pick them up. So if you guys are okay, I think you got another 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, hopefully this is whetting your appetite for the next the follow-on sessions where you'll get into more details about how we do all this. So why don't you continue on? Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, this is the one. Like I said, uh, originally Bureau of Mines, the plant which CDI made, and we were all involved when we built at the CDI. It was at uh, Amarillo, Texas, and this used to liquefy and the conservation of helium and supply to NASA and other DOA labs. And that's how only government was controlled and they used to share and only uh, the, uh, the excess helium was pumped back into the salt mines. And, and uh, this plant was decommissioned after with, uh, our industry convinced that we don't need this conservation. Um, I question myself, but I guess that's... And uh, that's been uh, what we brought it here. We took it to the test lab, we opened it, we modified it to fit the industrial needs, and we installed it 99. And that's operating from 99 to today. And that, they used to have this, uh, recipe machines and all that, and their availability was not so great before. And they weren't sure they want to go to the turbine plant. After that, got into this uh, with very good floating pressure diary cycle and where it meets its needs and everything. They are, they are thrilled that their availability is more than 99%. And this is SNS. This is another plant, JLab, basically to crude. I mean, we built the 2K box here at JLab. We bought from Lindy the 4K box and the compressor from PHBK. And we supplied the, all the transfer line design from JLab. And this is all, yeah, this is from PHPK, this is from Bendy. So this is a nitrogen. This we built at test lab here. We built all this. And this is all the equipment we built integrated. We commissioned it. And originally this was drawn 3.8 megawatts. And uh, we were turning it down where they needed to the Cold compressor limit of 70%, we can turn off those kind of cold compressor any believe on 70%, we brought down the, by one megawatt. Each megawatt today in electric power is half a million a year. So I mean, it's, it's a substantial money, just the bill, but environmental damage, the, we are using all this. And, uh, so it comes in many forms in helping us to reduce uh, the pollution contributions, so saving our resources. And saving our money, uh, so we don't have to pay the electric bill. So same thing happened at Brookhaven. I think around two or three, we had that power which increased the appetite for to look into what else can be done at Brookhaven. It was drawing around oh, when they called us around nine point four megawatts. Uh, yeah, they were drawing around nine point four megawatts when they called us, and 
they said, oh, you can change it to the floating pressure. And they didn't believe, so they argued with us, oh, it sounds like a snake oil. If you don't change anything, how can you save? So they said, oh, oh for two months they argued, uh, saying that oh, there's not that much can be done, but DOA is kept on insisting that you need to get this certified, saying that uh, this is the best you can do. And we said, it looks like that something can be done before we can sign up. So basically we agreed on a weekend. And now we change this to the floating pressure and we drop with no investment, went from 9.4 to 7.2. Think of the power in long era. It costs almost one and a half times more than here or more. That's approaching a billion dollar. <laughs> yeah, and then we did our, then uh, the management asked, what else can be done? We said, well, this is free. But if you put a little more investment for what you need, we can bring it down. So we installed another cargo step or another expansion stage. And now, from 9.4, they are presently operating at 4.8 a megawatt. I mean, each megawatt, like I said, has to. <laughs> so, uh, their saving uh, uh, is uh, around uh, 10,000 bucks a day or more. That's the present reduction in uh, electric power power. Then came the NASA James Webb. They said, oh, okay, we need to do this James Webb, which requires, we really don't know what the load is going to be, but we, because it's a long lead time, we need to procure this refrigerator way ahead. So we need a refrigerator which can really operate over a wide capacity range. And also they had a couple of refrigerators they bought from Lindy in the, oh, I think mid-90s, uh, 90s, 5, 98 time frame. And the stability of that wasn't that great. They have like two and a half Kelvin swing on the temperature control. They tried for 10 years and they gave up, basically. Then they called us, what can you do? They said, yeah, I mean, if, if you put it on floating pressure, it will make the system efficient, also you will improve that. So by changing the system to floating pressure, see this is how they used to have, depending upon, their capacity was somewhere here, but they were running around 300 watt per watt. We changed it to floating pressure, we brought down to 150 watt per watt. Now we are designing for them the new plant, which is around 14 kilowatt for the James Webb Pedestal Testing, which will vary from oh, 25, 30% to 100% with almost 100 watt per watt constant efficiency on this floating pressure. So, so there's, there's nothing to give up. I mean, we, they're not giving up anything. Only thing is everything they gain, I mean, like temperature stability, availability increase in availability, reduction in wear and tear, reduction in power down. And now this, this plant is also designed with a lot more capabilities. So like when we vary from 14 kilowatts down to 6 kilowatts, the efficiency is very close to constant. That's what the floating pressure brings in. I mean, if you look at it from 14 kilowatts down to 6 kilowatts, it's very constant. And also this plant is designed to do so many other things. They want to do racket engine testing and all that up to 100 kilowatt level. So this plant at higher temperatures can also produce up to 100 kilowatts and, and also, so this plant is built for NASA with so many functions which never been done before, with so many capabilities both in temperature, stability and uh, capacity variations. What's common in all these is like I said is the floating pressure, not to force the plant to the original years, just the plant they just installed within the parameters of safety to what it needs to adjust. Also, it's stated simply, it requires some serious uh, uh, input from the engineers to make sure they're not killing themselves with the turbines. And some of these turbines run at 300, 400,000 RPM. That's spent, so you don't want to get in their way. So you have to be very careful when you say, let it float. You want to make sure the safeties are in place before you allow it to float beyond their safety zones. So in summary, this is JLAB has established itself as the U.S. technology leader in cryogenics and the original successful and repeated uh, results in cryogenic system design, fabrication, installation, commissioning, as well as 24-7 operations. And we have more than 15 years, both 2K and 4K, unprecedented availability of supporting around the plant operations. We provide systems for ourselves and to, uh, like the uh, uh, 2K box design, ESR, standby. We've designed most of them ourselves, transfer lines, and to other labs like Michigan State, SNS, we build their plans. Um, only one, 
JLab is the only one in the US which has the Phuket um, system design for applications commissioning expertise. We participate in a lot of other labs in FSU, Fermi Lab, MSUS, and in NASA, all their graduate things. And uh, we are now, we save more than, yeah, we reduce 50% of its input power, almost here. Yeah. And Jefferson Lab has applied floating pressure to all our, all our JLab plants and on Michigan State and all these plants. Has multiple operating graduate <coughs> systems. They have all been operated. These are all unattended. See, another thing at JLab is we don't have people watching the screens around the clock. They all come in at 8 o'clock unless there is a call and they go, in, go home at 4. They don't show up. I mean, they, don't, they, are, they are not here for weekends except taking liquid nitrogen deliveries. But when we have a report of some non distribution or something not functioning well, the guard will page us, will come back and attend to it. So all these are happening, adjusting to the loads and everything with the floating pressure automatically in our system. So we don't force anything. We have, uh, how we got here is we have staff here with a lot of industrial experience and process analysis design from both industry and labs so working for a long time. So JLab is presently involved in the system design for 12 job upgrade, NASA, and all this stuff. So we've been recognized by DOAU for pollution prevention. White House, but, and we, we were in the White House, but this. that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. 